Galaxy 666 by Pell Toro. Session 7. Welcome back to Galaxy 666. As always, your faithful guide, Tug, here. Let us go immediately to and confront the elephant in the room, and I am certain you know of what I speak. Magellanic pseudopods with shurglegrass and chipped funkleweed, and cooked leg of herklebeast with onganga sauce. It isn't so much that these food items are almost entirely composed of made-up words to give the meal a more futuristic flair. It is the fact that they sound like made-up words to give the meal a more futuristic flair. But why? Why should Pell's creations be so much more jarring than, say, Lewis Carroll? A quick look at the first line of Carroll's poem Jabberwocky immediately reveals the same quantity of writer creations. "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe." Most all the words are invented, but there is not the same sense of pause that we feel in Pell's book, for even the title of Carroll's poem tells you we will be dealing with nonsense. A more reasonable comparison may be Frank Herbert's Chronicles of Dune, where we find such culinary inventions as kara eggs, wrapped gyrax, sidrit, and osthmere tubers. Also all clearly made up words, but somehow more believable. One possible clue may come from noticing that Herbert's words show more rhythmic variety. Listen to Pell's list again. Herkel, Funkel, Shurgel. The words sound contrived, yes, but the syllabic repetition really enhances the sense of artificiality. In Chapter 3, we receive more narrative from Bion about a planet in Galaxy 666. The concept of a galaxy is, at least from the perspective of our current state of space exploration, overwhelming to consider. Galaxies are composed of billions of suns and many more billions of planets. To provide an account of a galaxy would be exhaustive both to write and to read, even if devoting just a sentence to each world. Pell makes the logical and arguably wise step of focusing on a planet as a way of representing the nature of the galaxy to us. However, Pell's description of the planet continues to support our reasons for reading Galaxy 666 in the first place. They are simply bizarre and unexpected. When Bion first identifies that the world is inhabited, we tend to think of habitations of some sort of civilization. Will he mention cities, villages, other cultures? But Bion is, at his core, a foodie, noting instead that it was inhabited by delicious animals and succulent plants, and all for free. He is a cheap foodie. It is a unique observation, to say the least. Rarely, if ever, does one hear a hunter describe the fish that he just caught or the deer that he just shot as free. As we continue Bion's narrative, we reach one of the cruxes of the problems of Galaxy 666. Pell is under the gun to write, and his style of writing is almost stream of consciousness. As a way of getting out words, Pell often resorts to tangents, and his short wandering into cricket matches at Twickerham is a good example. The narrative focuses on Bion being thrown from the planet, and the cricket example he uses to illustrate the force with which his capsule is thrown is ill-derived. A person could not throw a cricket ball anywhere close to escape velocity, and it serves as a distracting segue into the cost of cricket tickets in the far future and how expensive it is to live on Earth, none of which advance the story or provide us with useful background. Contrast this to the ship that Bion sees arriving on the planet. What does Pell tell us of it? Nothing. Not a single detail. Bion tells us he was hanging in the air and then was placed in a space capsule. What was that like? What did he feel? See? Smell? Experience? No idea. The wonderfully delicious animals and plants. What color were they? What did they taste like? How did he trap them or even identify which were edible? No clue. Where the story cries out for detail, we come up empty. Even though Bion spends almost two months on the planet, all we really learn about it is that it is about the size of Earth, with clean air and free tasty food. Pell gives us our t-shirt quote of the session as he continues to reflect on how wonderful Earthmen are. They say that's why real Earthmen are so scarce. Their standards are so terribly high, most of them are dead. It is, in your humble guide's opinion, one of the best lines of the book, and one I would proudly sport on a fashionable colored jersey.
The reason why Earthmen are scarce? High standards. And having high standards leads, of course, to death. Priceless in its vapid nature. And a reason why I will continue to come back to Galaxy 666 over and over and over. We also get to meet one of our main characters in Chapter 3, Kitchley named Korzak, with two A's. He is tall and strong and apparently afflicted with the same alcoholic tendencies as his grandfather. On a quick break, not even a lunch break as he has no time to eat, he puts down a double shot of Alco before returning to his job, which is problem-solving. Shockingly, he doesn't seem to be doing well at it. Korzak introduces us to another one of Pell's overused devices. Pell gives us the appearance of wanting to use a specific phrase, in this case, it's my pigeon, but recognizes that it might appear anachronistic for his characters to use such a colloquial phrase. So instead of finding a new way to say it or writing around it, Pell will use a stock contextualizing phrase like, to use the words of the old Earth classics. He will often make specific references to the time in phrases describing the event, as in, as feverish as a 20th century typist. We will see this time and again in the future chapters. Finally, in Chapter 3, we bid a fond farewell to Bion and Milka. Apologize for the spoiler, but our companions for the first three chapters are not required any longer and will no longer appear. We have also heard the name of our second main character, Ishkla, and we will meet him shortly. Will he have the same propensity to drink as our first three characters? For that, we will need to go a little further into... Galaxy 666 Here ends Session 7.